Welcome everybody to the BS in Beer show. Tonight, BS obviously standing for building science. Tonight's topic is the Hudson Valley Preservation's deep energy retrofit of a 200 plus year old timber framed house with our special guest, Mason Lord. Um, it is starting to change seasons here in Maine. So sorry, all you beer drinkers, it's moving on to warm red wine. So right. having a nice Sister. petite Shiraz. <laughs> I'll be there with you soon. <laughs> All right. Uh, and I wanted to also introduce Rob tonight. We have Rob on as a special guest host uh, from Fine Home Building who also worked with Hudson Valley Preservation. So Rob, what are you drinking? Oh, thank you. Uh, on the fall theme here, I've actually got an Oktoberfest from Firefly Hollow Brewing in Bristol, Connecticut. So I was, I was feeling the, uh, the seasons change too. <laughs> <laughs> very nice very nice um so we just want to bs and beer started with local discussion groups and we want to encourage people to start your own groups in your local areas get together slightly less formal discussion than what we've been doing here on the bs and beer show but um more information on the beers bs and beer show.com if you want some uh, tips and tricks from some of the other people who have started their own groups we just ask you not to trademark the name and we want to thank our media partners tonight, Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building, for helping us put on this show every week. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike to talk about the mechanics of the show. Yes. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Mike Maines. Tonight I am drinking a Bunker Brewing Terrarium IPA. It's uh, very tasty in a cool can. Um, the uh, chat box, you know, if, if you're new, if you're new to the show, uh, a lot, a lot of activity happens in the chat box. If you're new to Zoom, at the bottom of your screen, you can find a thing to click to open up the chat box. Uh, feel free to type any comments, questions, um, whatever you want over there. Just uh, do us a favor and be sure to click all panelists and attendees. I'll probably remind you a few times. Uh, if you're on a mobile device, it may revert back to panelists only, but if you do panelists only, then only those on the screen see what you're saying, and we want everybody to see what you're saying. Um, if you only see one person at a time on the screen, um, at the top of your screen, you can probably select speaker view, gallery view. Different devices seem to be a little different, but uh, it's set up with six of us on the screen, so click some buttons until you see six of us. Um, for the agenda tonight, we'll start off with an introductory presentation from uh, Mason Lord. Uh, then we'll have a uh, panel discussion, uh, and then that will kind of slide into audience and panel discussion, and then it will devolve into a free form where anything goes. And we will wrap up uh, in an hour and a half, or at, at 7.30 Eastern time, so an hour, about an hour and a half from now. Uh, a video recording of tonight's show will be available at Green Building Advisor, and we encourage you to continue the conversation or ask questions over there. Um, all past shows can be found on YouTube, um, on our YouTube channel, which is BS and Beer, the BS and Beer Show, um, or through a link at our website, thebsandbeershow.com, and they're also on Green Building Advisor. And I will turn it over to Travis. Hey everyone, I'm Travis Brungart. Uh, I'm drinking a Boulevard Bob's 47 Oktoberfest. And uh, that makes sense because I'm in Kansas City. So why not drink a Boulevard beer, right? Uh, I'm handling the announcements tonight and I just threw something up on Instagram a little bit ago at the BS and Beer Show. Uh, so you can refer to that as well. But I'm going to go ahead and announce the events that we know about that are upcoming. You guys are always welcome to send those in to us uh, so that we don't miss them. Uh, I know that we have the Midwest Building Science Symposium, September 16th here in Kansas City. Uh, the Fine Home Building Summit, which is taking place virtually October 26th through 29th. Uh, we also have Nessie's Building Energy New York Conference, September 23rd through the 24th. The BS and Beer Book Club, where we're talking about the new carbon architecture. That's on the 24th. Passive House Training with Kramer Silkworth is September 14th through 18th. And Kramer's going to be a, a guest coming soon. He's a frequent attendee. Uh, he trained both Mike and Emily to be passive house consultants. So you definitely don't want to miss Kramer's training, which again is virtual through uh, NA, yeah, North American Passive House Network. And I think that's the last of the announcements I'm doing. And I'm going to sit back and relax and enjoy the show <laughs> after introducing Kylie. Hello, I'm Kylie Jacques, I'm the new senior editor at GVA. I'm still making my way through my Topo Chico uh, sparkling mineral water with a grapefruit twist. You might be hearing about those for a little bit, I have a big case of them. 
Um, let's see, I'd like to introduce Mason, who I have a bit of a relationship with, I'm glad to say. Um, he founded Hudson Valley Preservation, located in Kent, Connecticut, nearly 30 years ago. It's a small design build firm that specializes in historic preservation, offering whole house remodels and structural repairs. They work regularly on antique houses, many of which are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. His team of master craftspeople take tremendous pride in their work, as I can attest to having visited them on the project being featured here tonight. Mason's love of history and commitment to environmental stewardship are evident as soon as you start talking to him. He's also passionate about building science and is responsible for starting the Connecticut chapter of BS and Beer. He's an active audience member on the show each week, which makes it a treat to have him. And without further ado, it's your turn, Mason. Thank you, Kylie. Um, so I'm drinking an old time favorite. It's a Budweiser in a can. And I grew up in Baltimore where working in the summers was really nasty, hot and humid. And there was nothing better than a Budweiser in a can. And it had to be in a can. Uh, and this summer in Northwest Connecticut has reminded me of what it was like in Baltimore. So it's moving up. My sister was horrified that I'm drinking a Budweiser and not a Baltimore brewery. So what I've done is in a National Bohemian glass, Natty Bow, cheers to doing what we can to reversing climate change. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, so my assignment tonight is to present a case study uh, of a deep energy retrofit on an 18th century house. That will come, but in order to inform what I'm going to talk about, I have to go back and, and give a little bit of the history and how Hudson Valley Preservation developed into a company that's uh, very interested in energy efficiency. So who? Well, my company, I'm a carpenter, and my business partner, Dave Seegers, is a carpenter, and our crew members are carpenters, as well as the uh, administrative staff that helps us to keep things going. Um, the, uh, so, so how? What's the how? Um, we've always been, what I would say, uh, stretching ourselves. Um, doing things that we're not necessarily feeling totally comfortable with because it's the first time we've done it. Uh, in one of the earlier BS and Beers, it was a really great discussion and uh, Reggie LaBelle and John Deans from, uh, uh, I forget their company, Emerald Builders. They talked about how if you didn't feel uncomfortable on a job, you had to rethink how you were preparing and specifying and going about the work. The what? So we were working on a lot of old houses and we were discovering that things just weren't working. We would tear out a bathroom from an old timber frame house and the fiberglass insulation in the walls were uh, wet and rotting the sill beams. And there weren't a lot of choices, you know, 25, 30, 35 years ago and what to use for insulation. And it wasn't really like we could say, well, we don't want a, your house to get ruined, so we're not going to insulate it. So we were always looking for other ways to go about fixing houses and making things better. And the why? Typically, it was people wanted to be more comfortable and they wanted to save dollars. It really wasn't uh, any save the planet type of uh, philosophy. So Along the way too, getting educated was really important. And joining the Timber Framers Guild uh, was a really big step for us. And I was asked to give a talk at the 2016 uh, Timber Framer Guild Conference. And it was the hysterical folks in the greenies. And it was, you know, this kind of stuff going on because that's the way it is. And Brent Hall and Laura Case at uh, the August 20th BS and Beer, the chat box was like the Wall Street stock ticker. 
as things were just going on and on and on. And it was really <laughs> fascinating to watch. But there was, there was pushback from both sides. One thing that is really uh, almost non-negotiable when we talk about historic buildings is that preserving historic fabric and reversibility are two words that are very important, two uh, concepts that are very important to remember along the way. If you were given an assignment in a design school to design a structure that was extremely difficult to uh, air seal and insulate, and you designed an antique timber frame, you would get an A plus. It's not easy to figure out what to do with these structures because the timbers are on the exterior of the building. Um, they're, they have cracks. If you do a blower door test on a timber frame, there's air sucking through all of the joints. If you look at this, these pictures at the bottom, that black stuff, this is fiberglass insulation. And as I'm sure most people know here, fiberglass, if air is moving through it, is just like a filter. Uh, so that's just dirt from the road that has been sifting through the fiberglass of this old timber frame. So let's look at some of the things that we did along the way. And I'm going to start with what I would consider uh, mistakes, maybe misguided uh, attempts. Um, and I don't think Rob was with us when we were doing this one, but... Um, so it's early 2000s, spray foam is, at least it was on, on our, came into our radar at that point. And we had a 1739 salt box that the people wanted it to be more comfortable. They wanted to save money and we sprayed it with open cell spray foam. And, uh, you know, now I'm a little horrified by it. Um, so the lessons that we learned from that, you know, we're always looking for a better way. And I think we were seduced by the, the idea that we could really make this house perform better. It was all about operational carbon. Um, you know, we have used spray foam since then, um, but we've been looking for techniques that maybe you could release in between the, the rafter bays or the stud base so that it's not irreversible because looking at that thing up at the top there, there's no way that's ever getting taken out. We've talked about in previous BS and beers uh, about low hanging fruit uh, when remodeling a house and crawl spaces and basements, attics are the places and uh, you want to stop the moisture from coming up into a house. That's a big improvement. And generally, they're not that expensive projects. You can insulate foundation walls if they're smooth enough. You know, the stone foundations are really difficult to do that. But if it's block or concrete, it's certainly available. One of the simplest techniques and one of the biggest leak areas is a uh, timber sill where it meets the stone foundation and the floor system above. And in this house, above grade timber sill, uh, we were using sheet foam and a uh, little bit of spray foam around the edges. Uh, today, I think we would prefer using uh, something like rock wool. Uh, we would stay away from fiberboard because of rot potential down low. Um, but being that we're not insulating on the exterior of the building, this timber sill on the other side can dry to the exterior. We've talked about education of our clients a lot. I know Travis talks about uh, his clientele in the Midwest and how important it is to educate. So we came up uh, quite a few years ago with a, uh, an agreement that we get in with our clients where we get paid and it, we call it an x-ray agreement. And we'll go in and they, they have problems with their house, this particular house. Uh, they were spending about 500 a month on oil and it was very uncomfortable. So our 
uh, assignment was to improve the energy efficiency. And we did a blower door test because they could get some money from the state of Connecticut. But the numbers, you know, we couldn't even register real numbers. The, uh, the hand over here, there's a piece of plastic that was on the window that's just getting sucked into the building. So we show them through a PowerPoint presentation what they have and then what the solutions might be. So the eyeballs are explaining to the people that when you look down here, this is what you see. You have no insulation in your uh, sloping ceiling in the bedroom here. Um, so what are you gonna do about it? Well, in this situation, we used foam insulation on the attic rafters, but before we did that, we blew, uh, you know, we blew cellulose down into those cavities and then got all the way to the top and blew it down from the styrofoam and then filled it out. Um, it's a decent solution. Again, I'm not crazy about using uh, sheet foam or spray foams in buildings. The, the uh, flaw in this system is that at the perimeter of an antique timber frame, there's a big beam. So the air flowing from the walls will go right up into that big beam and you're at risk of uh, ice dams. In uh, 2017, we, uh, my company joined Nessie and we became members of Bottom Lines, which is peer review groups. And I really doubt that one, I would have even heard of BS and Beer, and two, would be on this show if we hadn't joined Nessie. And this, the house on the upper right is an 18th century house that had problems with energy efficiency. So I had learned about wood fiber board. And what you're seeing here is Gutex wood fiber board, which is two and three eighths of an inch thick and is about an 8.6 uh, R value. Uh, on the floor is Intello paper that gets, uh, I think it's called Tescanvana tape. And this is all from 475. So it's not a huge R value here, um, but it improved the house incredibly the people are much more comfortable and it's become much more energy efficient. I would call this low hanging fruit. You notice that there is duct coming up here. So one option that we presented to the homeowners was, you know, cause we were replacing the heating system, which was an oil fired furnace, which we replaced with two uh, gas furnaces. And the one in the attic, we could have enclosed in fiberboard enclosed box, the furnace itself, and then the ductwork, but the price point was too high, so the owner decided just to go uh, to this length. And then the last one of these uh, preambles to the deep energy retrofit, this is a uh, 1750s original home here with an 1830s and 1960s greedy dormer and so we talked about historic fabric there's not a lot of historic fabric on the north elevation of this home and you know i use this slide to show the homeowners what was going on with their house and this was an extremely cold room so we brought in the ir camera and pointed out to them that on this cold February day when they had their thermostat set at 55 degrees, underneath their baseboard, it was 55 degrees. So a great tool, and this was the, uh, the iPhone version of a FLIR uh, IR camera. So we, we moved the needle a little bit more and we used Gutex, again, two and three eighths of an inch on the sidewall, just the north elevation. We really wanted to seal the crawl space and the mineral wool, well, 
The fiberboard we don't want too close to the ground because it's wood and if it gets wet, it's gonna rot. So it can get wet. Don't get me wrong, it can get wet, but if it's sitting in, in uh, water or dirt, splash up, it's gonna have problems. So the mineral wool is gonna be much better prepared for that scenario. So by going below grade with the mineral wool, we were able to seal off the crawl space uh, and the north elevation uh, got new insulation in the wall cavities. We use mineral wool there and then fiberboard in the, uh, for the skin. Uh, fine home building, that's Matt Milham uh, taking some shots. Um, I don't think this part of the job got into fine home building, but we were the cover story with about uh, repairing the rotten timber sill. And this guy hiding over here, Robert, uh, he was the cover model. I don't have that picture, but uh, that was a lot of fun to have that happen. And it, so we have Gutex two and three eighths, and then the Mento uh, air barrier on the inside of that assembly. And this timber frame happens to be a plank wall construction, which means the original construction of this house was timber frame, about inch and a quarter planking with clapboards nailed to the exterior and lath and plaster to the interior. Uh, so really just about as inefficient as you could possibly have. Uh, during this job, I got a text from Ian Schwant, uh, our lead carpenter on the job, and uh, the painter's car had caught fire. And I responded to him by saying, Ian, I think all of the carbon that we sequestered in that fiberboard just went up in smoke. <laughs> so moving on. Um, this is an 1803 Federal in Millbrook, New York, with an 1829 porch on the front. Um, in the uh, Secretary of Interior standards, this would be considered a preservation. So somebody might want to restore it to the original 1803 and they would put the original Federal period front entry on it. But the homeowners who are historians knew that the 1829 porch was put on when one of their daughters got married. So they were just like people buy a new car today. The status symbol was let's be the coolest and the greatest with the next phase of uh, architecture. So this Greek revival entry stayed. This is not a candidate for a deep energy retrofit. Um, there's too much good detail. It, it would really be horrifying to take all of the woodwork off of this and then stretch it out. It would, it would lose the proportions. It would be really a travesty. Not a travesty, but a travesty. So uh, what we're gonna look at, this next house that we're doing a uh, deep energy retrofit on is a rehabilitation. So we're keeping this house standing and we're moving it into a next phase. And if all goes well and, and things stay the way they are, you know, the goal is 100 years, 200 years, who knows. So here, here's the house, the 1780-ish uh, timber frame cape. Um, we have a great team that we've worked with on this project. Uh, the owner is wonderful and really uh, excited and, and loves this house. Um, Jill Neubauer Architects, um, we've been working with to, for the design work, fire tower engineering, and Jordan Goldman from Zero Energy Design has been working with us. And then uh, our trade contractors and vendors, you know, when we get into a project, it's collaborative. Um, everybody's working together for the same goal. And the history. So why is this house okay to uh, tear apart and not care about things like those windows and clapboards? Well, 
There was a 1900 renovation approximately. Uh, we think in the 1960s, they did something where they put shed dormers on the back and the front. Because we know this because there's uh, in the 1972 renovation, there are Douglas fir two by six rafters on the, the whole lower section of roof. We know it was 1972 because one of the carpenters wrote behind the walls, Yahoo in 72 in just about every month along the way. And I looked the guy up and Wayne Richard is still living. He lives in Torrington, Connecticut, and he remembers this house very well. And I've asked him to find pictures. Um, Wayne is 84 years old. Uh, so in the 1982 renovation, uh, this is all new clapboard siding, cedar clapboard siding. These are Brasco windows. And uh, if I was zooming in here, you'd see a pretty rotten window here. Um, and then from some of the history of the building, this was a dwelling house for the Bantam River. This is the title of this project is the Bantam River Project. And in the river below, since the 1790s, there were a number of mills, grist mills, sawmills, there was a blacksmith shop, and uh, there were some factories down there too. So what are we dealing with in this building that make it very difficult to, to become a net zero house? Well, for one, there's six fireplaces in there. Um, the sheathing behind these clapboards is board sheathing. There's a fieldstone foundation. And to top it all off, the building leans about four inches to the north. So it's out of plumb leaning like that. So some of the existing conditions that you see inside, um, I don't know if everybody on the this Call is old enough to remember quarry tile, but we have some beautiful quarry tile in the hearth, uh, some wonderful 1970s lights. Um, this, the original stairway would not have been a winder staircase like this. Uh, some of the original fabric that is left, this is 18th century paneling in here, 18th century uh, casing on the summer beam. The fireboxes here have been rebuilt. Um, and one thing that we picked up is that the 1900 renovation is when they straightened the doors. So these doors don't lean three inches, but however, the paneling does. Upstairs, uh, another firebox that was probably done in the 1970s. So we didn't have a lot of historic fabric that we were feeling guilty about having to take apart. So we gutted the interior and we gutted the exterior. We're saving the original oak floors, the, any of the uh, casings around beams, um, uh, all of the stuff that we consider as historic fabric has remained. And so we're looking at, um, over here, that's the same room. This was not the original staircase here, but it is an earlier one. Um, the floor joists are like five by five floor joists. The attic rafters are five by fives and they're spaced uh, about 46 inches on center. Uh, this is, so when the, for whatever caused the building to lean to the north and whether that was through rotten timber sill beams on the sills or whether that happened maybe when they put the dormers on it, uh, the far right here is just giving you an example of uh, some of the timber frame joinery. So when we started ripping things apart, um, we found few uh, different uh, years of when work was done and, and the fiberglass insulation, 1970s renovation, you can see the mouse holes uh, drilled through the fiberglass. Rodents just love fiberglass. They nest in it. They take it around the house and make nests in other places. 
interestingly, there was blown in cellulose and the blown in cellulose, which don't really know when that happened, uh, but that was uh, in much better shape than the fiberglass. And I mentioned that there was a factory uh, and the factory was what was known as a scythe rifle factory. So the rifle was not a gun, it was a sharpening implement for the guys in the field to sharpen their scythe blades. And we found in the wall, encased in the cellulose, a four foot long scythe blade. And I'm old enough where there were not weed whackers and I used a scythe. And I can't imagine a four foot long scythe blade. And this thing was razor sharp when we pulled it out. Um, and then we were also, at some point in time, they did spray foam on the uh, top two feet of the sill beam, of the uh, foundation, Fieldstone Foundation, as well as on the timber frame sill. We replaced about three quarters of the sill. And uh, so, and we also, because we're gonna skin the exterior of the building, we wanted the sill to be able to dry to the interior. So this is the early part of the job where we're replacing the sills, the, the uh, kickers that you see over here are supporting the building. We use pressure treated six by eights. Here you can see the uh, board sheathing. And we know that's from the 1900 renovation because a lot of the board sheathing was nailed up with cut nails. Uh, wire nails weren't typically used until the 20th century late 19th, early 20th, and cut nails in rural, rural areas certainly could have been used into the 20th century. And I wanna point out a detail that the Brasco windows had back in the 70s. This is the, the kick out starter course for a clapboard, and it's integral with this top casing. And I have to say, I'd love to see window manufacturers do some of this more. Um, so I don't think people think highly of Brasco windows at this point in time, but they had it right back in the 70s. So what are we doing uh, to, to get to our goal of uh, net zero? Uh, the drawing on the left shows the, the existing conditions. Um, we have four inch oak studs where we don't have the the nine, typically nine inch timber frame posts. Uh, we have a lot of one by eight pine board sheathing, which in places we had to replace with plywood. Um, so on this job, we are using um, uh, products from Sega and Styco. So the, the self-adhered membrane that we're using is the Mavest 500 SA and we're using the four inch therm dry fiber board. Um, and you'll see in the next pictures, uh, the assemblies going together. The, we're, we've been working with Rothoblos to give us the engineering as well as the fasteners for our drain plane. So this is a one by three, which is doing, serving two purposes. It creates the three quarter gap for the drain plane as well as um, uh, helping to hold up the wood fiber board. Um, and then we're going to use boral clapboards on the exterior. And one reason we like boral clapboards is it holds paint really well. It has a very sharp, crisp edge. Um, and we've had good success with it. So we've, this is our first uh, go round with a self-adhered membrane. Uh, so the, the, the north elevation got it first. And one thing I noticed about it was when the sun hit it, it was like a bad taping job on the inside of a, house, of a contemporary home. When the sun hits that half hour a day on that bad tape job and it just shows every little wrinkle or whatever, these we ended up grinding the wood, the uh, uh, plank siding, uh, sheathing 
to get it smoother, but even places that we didn't get everything, but it, none of this penetrated through the air barrier. So this is our primary air barrier. Uh, so on the inside of that is the studding, and then from there will be the uh, drywall and skim coat plaster. On the picture on the left, these are uh, thermal bucks, and they are a foam product. They create a break in the window opening, as well as a place that we can run our uh, fiberboard to, and we'll be able to tape this seam here. Our pallets of Stico getting ready to go on, and with the, uh, we took the overhangs off the building, they'll get rebuilt, and you can see that the house is wrapped like a present right now. Um, we would have liked to have been able to do a blower door test at this point, but the electric service on the, uh, the far corner is still on the building. Um, if you don't live in Connecticut, you might not be aware that we had some vicious storm. Uh, we had a tropical storm in August 4th, and so our chance of getting a guy to put a new pole in, which is what we need, is uh, we still don't have the pole. So anyway, there's a big hole there. We still have holes in the foundation. We're gonna do a blower door test uh, later, but we just couldn't get it at this point. We'll still have the advantage of caulking and caring, as Travis says, on the inside of the board sheathing. Uh, so this is some progress here. The Stico going on um, here in the lower left, you can see the thermal bucks have been taped. Uh, we, we used uh, Sega's Wiglove tape. The Stico needs to be primed for the tapes to stick. And it's very important that that's done not only well, but also beyond the tape. Um, We've learned quite a bit about working with this therm dry fiberboard, and it is a pretty soft material. Um, the advantage of it over some of their other products, Universal Dry. Uh, so the therm dry has uh, R, so these, this is four inch thick. And the therm dry is R14.5, so it's about 3.7 per inch. The universal dry, same four inches, is R12, and so that's about three per inch. Um, but the universal dry is more expensive um, and lower R value, but it's more durable. Um, so great care has to be taken when, we're, when using the therm dry. So the tools that we used, we're, we're drilling. These are the fasteners from Rothabloss. Um, and they're, some of them, the, the horizontal screws are eight inches long and the, the angled screws are 10 inches long. And when driving these screws with impact guns into uh, oak, you know, 100 year plus oak framing, um, our impact guns just really couldn't drive it. Uh, some of them we could get all the way, but others we'd get most of the way. You know, you can drive it, pull it out, drive it, pull it out, and it acts somewhat like a, uh, uh, like a drill bit. But Jim Uhaw from Rothabloss, who came to the job and he helped us engineer this, he gave us a tool that we could put onto one of our drivers. This is called a catch. And if you're careful, you won't break your wrist because this doesn't have any impact. It just drives the screw straight in. At some point in time, Hudson Valley Preservation bought a Speedmatic Porter Cable 10-inch skill saw. And we've been using that to cut the, the Stico. It cuts, it leaves about an eighth of an inch. 
Um, this old tool still cuts smooth. It still cuts square. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. And in the lower right hand corner, that's one of our carpenters slash administrative personnel, Nancy. And she, she's showing her hands that are covered with Stico because we, we first were using paint brushes to put the primer on. And I don't think we read the directions on the primer, which said you should use a roller. So we, we have since, I think, improved the, the uh, hand mess from the Stico. So these, la these last pictures are um, progress, recent progress. This is from, I think, Tuesday of this week. Um, we're getting the fiberboard on the roof. What you're seeing here are, so on the 46 inch rafters, 46 inch on center, we're putting full length two by fours as the hold down for the, uh, the wood fiber board. And it's also acting as uh, a, a base for our skipped sheathing. So the roof that's gonna go on here is gonna be a taper sawn Western red cedar roof. And um, we wanna create an air channel underneath the shingles. So double duty, this two by four is screwed into the rafter. Now, it's only screwed into the old rafter about halfway because remember they put the dormers in and there's two by sixes down here. The, the full length five by five timber frame rafters are on the gable end and each uh, elevation the first rafter in. But here we, we lose and we can only get the good solid screw in the very bottom. So in between here, we will be putting the, the additional uh, into the two by six dug for rafters. You can see uh, we, we are plumbing the building here. So on this side, it's zero at the top and about four inches at the bottom. So as of today, um, and if you look at the north elevation, it's the opposite. So we're about four inches out up here uh, to nothing on the bottom. Uh, so we originally were thinking we were going to use blown in cellulose for the tapered wall, but we switched to uh, rock wall because we think it just was going to be a better uh, solution to uh, insulating this piece of the wall. So on the inside of this are the original studs, they're gonna get blown in cellulose. On the outside here, we have rock wool, and then we'll do the wood fiber board on that. Um, and here we are at the, the uh, edge of the roof with uh, the wood fiber board. This roof is not straight. There's dips and sags and bows. Uh, we've straightened the, we'll straighten the gable ends um, and we'll use the framing to do our best to straighten the, the overhang, which will be a new overhang. And so the next step, once we get the whole building uh, uh, covered with the insulation, the fiberboard, we'll, we will build the, the new overhangs. And we've, we've built a, a mock-up uh, and here is this gap here, which is the channel to get the air up in underneath the two by fours. Uh, we'll have coroplast as the uh, coroplast is like signboard that has gaps in it that will allow air to flow. One thing I'll say is it's really important to build mock ups and something like this. If you look at this one, you notice it's a piece of three quarters here on top of the fiber board. Our original plan was to use three quarters, uh, but for one, we wanted to have greater strength to hold the, the overhang, um, as well as we were advised by Rothoblos that it's gonna be a better way to hold the, the uh, fiber board on the building. Uh, 
this, really, this is the end of the presentation, but what I was, I put this slide in here because we did do some experimenting with release papers for uh, spray foam. So we've got, uh, I think, some filter fabric, some felt paper, and I think that's just a blue uh, uh, weather barrier. So I don't think we have any great conclusions from that. I think that the felt paper actually worked the best. So that is, that is it. And I see there's 99, com 99 comments in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Take that with a grain of salt. They were having a good time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Independent of it all, right? <laughs> but there, there certainly were some good questions that come up. Uh, and, and some of them were, you know, what was your decision making tree on what you decided to do and kind of in what order? Wow, that's a tough question. Um, <laughs> Uh, decision tree. How, how do we like? In, I think we have to to narrow it down to. Yeah, yeah. I think I think teams. I think I think I think Emily is referring back to a question Justin actually had, which was your uh, what's your what was your your decision tree on on how to deal with the lid with the with the with the roof or or. Um, what, was this the project where you also had fiberboard at the attic floor or no? Oh, no okay. 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 That, that's another project. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so, so how, how did you decide what to do on the roof? I guess that's the, well, what I would say is the, the, the decision tree started the first day that I met, um, the owner as well as Jill Neubauer, the architect for the project when we were being interviewed for the project. So we were interviewed along with two other builders and um, the conversation was, you know, Jill was familiar with fiberboard. We were, we were talking about how we would do it. And we were on the same page with that. Um, so that was the start of it. And then when working with uh, Jordan Goldman, um, you know, we just, continued on with that and we were leaning on our consultants to you know one question we had was well these tapered walls what are we going to do with them and you know do we leave them uninsulated do we have to insulate them you know what's the right move there um and, and you know we got confirmation from jordan that yeah we should be insulating those tapered uh, walls uh i don't know if that answers the question enough. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, well, but, but certainly, um, you know, I didn't mention the difference between operational carbon and embodied carbon. Um, and that is something that certainly Nessie has been a big influence on us. So operational carbon is the stuff that goes out of your smokestack as well as getting it to your house. The embodied carbon is what goes on in the material uh, manufacture. So foam and spray foam have a high carbon uh, imprint just in the manufacture. And what we're learning or what we have learned, um, uh, Jacob and Ace and Chris Magwood who are doing studies, uh, of new frameworks, um, we don't have time to look at a hundred year life cycle for a house. We have to start with the carbon on this end of, you know, on the material side. So that's why we're looking at plant-based building materials, you know, trees, plants. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with new frameworks. They're building with straw bales. Um, we're not going to build straw bale houses, but we're going to use what we can in the, uh, closer to the earth material. Excellent. Well, and and that that kind of answers a question from Drew, which is why why do this type of project instead of instead of leaving it as as an unfinished or as an unconditioned house and and building a a new house next door? You're you're using the 
the heavy embodied carbon of the frame and the foundation and some of the infrastructure, you're, you're keeping that there, right? Is that the, yes. that's yeah. the gist? Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what, one question uh, Audrey had, um, I might have missed it because I was having too much fun uh, bashing Justin in the comments, but uh, <laughs> what, what, what are the windows? What did you use for windows? And oh, why? yeah. <laughs> yep. It's uh, their uh, low end triple pane windows. Okay. Oh, yeah. They're double, double hongs. Yeah. I, I had a list of materials that I'm sure I uh, missed some of them. Um, you know, we're going to do the, the, there's a barn on the property that's in really bad shape uh, that's going to get taken down and a new barn's going to get built and the solar is going to go on the new barn. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. But yeah, low and triple pane windows. Excellent. And Harvey I, had a good question. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, Har 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 Harvey asked a question that, that, that I would have asked also, which is at, at the sill, did you include a capillary break and how did you make a continuous air control layer at the sill? Um, the answer to that is no, we did not have a capillary break there. Um, but what we did is we wrapped Ventrum tape uh, from the sill to the foundation. So we at least have an air uh, barrier there. Um, you know, with the Fieldstone Foundation, uh, it's just, and, and you're replacing a sill, and we didn't replace all of the sill beams. Um, it's just, I, somebody, if somebody knows a way to, to create that capillary break on an, you know, a building that's not getting set on top of the Fieldstone Foundation, I'd love to know about it. <laughs> So on that one, Mason, there's a, there was an article that Joe Stiebert wrote, I think it's on Building Science's website, about how um, <clears throat> he had guys actually jack up the house in sections and slip pieces of uh, like basically ice and water barrier between the beams and the foundation in 10 foot runs. Yep. So jack up sections, at, little sections at a time and just slip a, a waterproof membrane in between there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that you know, that sounds really good in practice. It, it's, I don't know how you do it. I mean, it, we, we, when we're t replacing sills, we're, we're taking the weight off. We're really not trying to raise the building. Um, so I'm not saying it can't be done, but it just adds another layer of uh, expense and, and how much are you gaining from it? I don't know. I, you know, it's certainly something that we would want to be able to do. And if we can come up with something on the interior, well, of course, it's not, it's not going to stop the capillary piece of the right. thing. Well, but, it all, but, or go ahead, Rob, sorry. I was going to say, it also really depends if it's, a, if it's a rubble foundation, it depends on the stone. If you've got igneous rock, if you've got granite in there, you don't really need to worry about the capillary break. If you've got limestone, it's a bigger concern. Yeah, and it is granite, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> Uh, J uh, Justin and some others have asked about costs. I know that's always tricky, so don't feel like you have to answer, but if you wanted to help us understand how you price out something like this or what square foot costs are or what, a, or does a deep energy retrofit make financial sense? Um, if you want to plead the fifth, that's okay, but um, if you want to address any price questions, people are curious. Yeah, no, I, I, I anticipated that question. <laughs> um, so, what you what we have to remember is that this is going to be a beautiful house. Um, there's two two and a half bathrooms. There's a kitchen. There's built-in cabinets. It's all new appliances. We're doing skim coat plaster. Um, so it's about it's between four and four fifty four four hundred and four fifty a square foot for the house. Okay, which is probably roughly what. You, what a typical high quality new house would cost the, there i would i would guess right i mean i mean i mean that's the that's a little more than than a nice new house around here but it's it's certainly within the range of an upper upper end new house yeah yeah no it's um and you know the owner um when i knew i was going to be on here i sent him an email and asked um you know why you know give me some of your 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 thinking and he very kindly wrote me back with some really good stuff. Um, you know, he wanted to mitigate 
the environmental costs associating, because this is a second residence, so with maintaining an additional residence, um, he was, his primary motivation, he wanted to have a very efficient, ecologically friendly home, and that he thinks is a moral reason he's willing to pay more for it, just like he would pay more for food that is grown properly or goods made in America or services that pay producers fairly. In the design end of things, he, knew, he knows from himself that designing from scratch, he would end up designing and building a pretty nice house that would take significantly, significantly longer to get designed and have a high square foot cost. Um, and he really liked the house and he loved the history. Nice. Well, maybe, maybe, uh, or maybe after this show, I can talk to you about how to get more of those kinds of clients. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe I missed it, but I think it came up a couple of times in the chat box on the fireplaces. How many of the fireplaces were operational after you finished that? And I think you said you, you haven't run a blower door number or a blower door test. So what are you expecting to get? Because fireplaces are notoriously terrible if you're going to leave them leaky. Yes. Well... So our experience with blower doors is very small. I bought our first blower door during the pandemic from a guy on Martha's Vineyard. It took about six weeks because it had to come over the ferry. My niece, my niece picked it up, took it to my sister who lives in Weston, Mass. <laughs> And then I drove to, to Sturbridge, Mass, to a coffee shop and picked up the blower door. So um, the numbers, I have no idea. Um, what, what we really want to use the blower door for is to find the leaks, you know, because we'll use that. We'll see where the air is escaping. Um, and the fireplaces, the owner wants to have two wood stoves and an operational fireplace. So the, the chimney has been relined. There is uh, clay liners in the chimney. There are six fireplaces. Um, we're gonna put Lyman's dampers on the second floor fireplaces he really doesn't wanna use. So we're gonna put Lyman's dampers on the top there and probably something shoved up into the, up into the flue uh, what that is, I'm not sure, um, but we'll chip away at it once we get to a place where we can do a blower door. But, you know, net zero is going to be tough. Yeah. Someone in the chat box said chimney balloons, which I was just going to chime in there. We've done, you know, we've done several retrofits in this fireplace, but as a reminder, like hang a little sign on the damper that says, take me out if I'm going to use this first. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. But um, yeah, it'll, it'll be hard with the blower door. Uh, good luck with your blower door. It's a great tool to use for, for checking for leaks. Um, but uh, it'll, it'll be hard with, with net zero to overcome six fireplaces worth of leakiness. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I know. So, you know, we're doing, we're doing what we can. Um, and we'll see. Mason, were there products that you used on this project that you hadn't, used before. I seem to recall you mentioning a couple. Are, can you talk about some of those and, and some of the things that you learned about using them for the first time? Um, well, we'd never used a self-adhered membrane and we really liked that. Um, it, that was a real pleasure to use. It, it goes on really nicely. I like it a lot better than, than uh, you know, tack up. Uh, weather barrier. Um, we had never used the thermal bucks. Uh, like them, they seem to be, you know, at first I was thinking, is this just overkill? But the best part, I and I, I don't understand completely, you know, what it all does, but the fact that you can tape the wood fiber board to the thermal bucks, uh, I think is critical. Uh, the, you know, we have used Rothoblos fasteners, but we haven't used them quite in this way. 
Uh, let's see what else. We've never used low and windows. Uh, so I would say that's of the products. Uh, that that's those are the ones. A, 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 or go ahead. Uh, Travis, just I'm wanted to enough. follow up on the uh, the taping of the 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 thermal buck window flange to the um, to the wood fiber board. I'm thinking that you're you're already managing both air and water with the my vest, right? So is the taping at the the flange to the fiber board for water at that stage? Is that what you're solving for? That's yes, that's water okay. at that point. But it, you know, belt and suspenders. Sure. It's yeah. Uh, just want to understand. Yeah. No, that's that. That's what it is. It's for water. Gotcha. And you know, when we flash these windows, we're going to be, you know, that we'll take the the flashing cap head flashing back to the wood fiber board. You know, go up. We'll tape that. You know, we've talked on this BS and beer about what I remember uh, Brian talking a couple of weeks ago, you know, what are we the most worried about in our building assemblies now? And it's tape. Um, so we will be taping that. Uh, and, you know, we, we have to prime and the priming part is it slows you down because it takes a little while to dry. Um, so you have to, it, it's, good to plan that out so that you can move quickly, prime it the day before or hours before. Did, or Mason, did you do any, any, any tr tr treatment to the frame for powder post beetles or, or anything like that? Or, or was the frame even accessible enough to, to, to worry about treatment? Um, we, you know what, that's a really good question. We've, we've used borates for different things. Um, I, you know, powder post beetles are, I've been, I've been tearing apart, apart old buildings since, you know, like 1984. And I've never actually seen a powder post beetle. <laughs> I have seen their talcum powder dust when they emerge from a piece of wood, but I've never actually seen a powder post beetle. Um, I'm not sure how effective uh, treating for powder post beetles actually is. Does it really do anything? We have in certain instances used borate rods where you drill a hole and you put a rod and the theory is that when it gets wet, uh, the borates will spread into the timbers. Um, uh, my partner Dave, who was on here, I he was he. I think he did some borate work on the building, but I really don't know how extensive it's been. Yeah, Dave's. He said they did spray with a borate solution, and then I guess another point, Mason, is if you're doing such uh, tight air sealing, encasing the frame inside those walls as opposed to like a typical leaky wall, are you really concerned that they're going to get in there in the first place? Right. Well, yeah, stopping the moisture problem because all wood boring insects like wet, moist wood. So we're, we're taking care of that. It's also we're, one thing we're lucky about with all the, the problems that the house has, it's really well drained soil. Um, it's, it's like a gravel bank with sand. So the basement's dry. Um, any, um, there's been a few questions about the wood fiber insulation. I'm kind of curious. I know Sean is on from four, seven, from four, 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 seven, five, but was there anything specific that led you towards Styco instead of Gutex? I know those are the two primary brands right now of, 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 of wood fiber insulation. Was it a price thing or availability or performance or? Um, it wasn't performance. Um, I would say it was mainly price yeah. and, and yeah. 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 And, and any concerns there about moisture accumulation, rot, fire resistance, all the usual concerns about, <laughs> exterior wood fiber insulation? Well, from what I understand, uh, 
the wood fiber board is very fire resistant. Um, I don't know if you can definitely believe the marketing that the fiber board people do, but I'm pretty sure Styco has some videos on their website that are really fun because they take blow torches and they, and they burn different types of insulation and the wood fiber board performs better than even the, the rock wall. Now, this is blow torching of a piece that they put a tennis ball inside a little box and you know, you watch what burns the tennis ball and what doesn't. Um, but it's their marketing, so I don't know. But in theory, it's very fire resistant. Um, yeah, if it, it, it is paraffin based, so you know, it's like 91% wood fiber and 5% uh, paraffin and it, it is a water barrier. You know, it's tongue and groove. Um, so, and with the drainage plane, um, you know, Christine Williamson building uh, Fight Club, you know, she talks about bulk water management and, and how much materials can handle. And I'm, that, I'm not worried about that. I, I'm more yeah. worried about somewhere that water would get directed in and it's just a constant leak that could be a problem. So, so Mason, somebody had a question about the uh, purlins on the roof there. So you've got pretty far spaced rafters there. Are you planning on doing then skip sheathing on top of those purlins? Is that the, the plan? Yeah, we'll do <clears throat> one by four. Um, and they are going to be a lot closer. You know, we're, we were not finished with that. So we may have to up it to five quarter purlins, but that'll be you know like five quarter by four or one by four all the way up the roof yeah and, mason and I, it's true oh, go ahead mike or no i was i, I was just go, going to ask if the red cedar sh sh shingles are, are 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 treated for for for, for fire resistance or not uh right now they're not um we're using T uh, taper sawn red cedar shingles. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good question though. And I have a feeling if, uh, I know that the owner's not watching this tonight, but you <laughs> might see it on, uh, on recording and I'm, I'm probably gonna get asked that question. Well, I've, I've installed a few or roofs with with red cedar untreated and the houses are all still standing if that if that if that puts you at ease at yeah yeah i'm not if we were in fire country yeah uh, the, the shingles tend to stay somewhat wet sure it rains a lot here <laughs> yeah mason <laughs> i was going to ask you about your energy. relationship with um zero energy design because i know a bit of their work and it strikes me that this might be an unusual project for them. Is is that true? And I know they came up with that um, tapered um, stud detail and I was wondering what you may have learned from them that you hadn't come across before or I'm just kind of curious about your relationship there. Uh, this is the first job we've worked with them. Mm -hmm. So um, it was it was nice to have somebody that could look at the assembly and tell us that, yeah, you should insulate this um, or you shouldn't insulate it. Um, you know, there, when we look at assemblies, I don't understand all of the, you know, where do you put this piece compared to that piece? You know, what's the best way to do it? Um, from what I understand, you want the air barrier as close to the interior heated space as possible in general, um, but I, it's great to have a consultant that, that says this is the way to go, somebody that really knows what they're talking about. So, but we have not worked with them before. I don't know that they worked on a lot of timber frames. I, I think their work is, and I could be wrong, maybe somebody can correct me, but I think they do primarily new construction. So I just, I thought it might be an interesting project for them, but. Yeah. Yeah. I may have missed it. I was going to say as well, did you do energy modeling at all on this house? Did you do an energy um, model for this? Yeah. Jordan did energy modeling. Yep. Yeah. 
So, so with the energy modeling of the house, do you have, d- did you come up with target uh, numbers you're going for, for anything? Cause like you said, obviously the chimney is going to be a sort of a, a, a mystery as far as how much that impacts the, uh, the energy uh, numbers, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I do not have the answer to that question. I don't know what the numbers they're, they're shooting for. Yeah. The, this goes, go, goes back, back, back a ways. Um, your, your engineered uh, wrote, wrote the blast and whatever the uh, fancy name is for the installing jig. Um, I know boral siding is, is heavy, but is that, do you think that was overkill for that that situation? I mean, that, I can understand it for six inches of extra insulation, but if you're if you're doing less, do, do, do you think that was necessary or a good practice to to have the angled screws and the engineered approach? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I did wonder, but I had a conversation with uh, Ben Bruengraber from uh, Fire Tower today about another project and. He really emphasized the importance, especially of the angled screws, that the straight in screws are over time, uh, they just, they're gonna sag. Um, sure. So uh, I think it's good practice, definitely. Well, another reason I think, I, f- I feel like this is something even you taught me, Mason, years ago, is like you always wanna shoot the fasteners up at an angle anyway, just for, uh, for for drainage reasons, for you know having moisture intrusion into into an assembly, right? Uh, good point. Yeah. Yep. Well, and I I I, I think I trust Ben because he's the one who told me what to study in college when I told him I wanted to be a timber farmer when I grew up, and uh, I, I I think he steered me in the right direction. I'm not sure, but <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, th- there was one recent. Oh, um, somebody was asking, sort of off topic, but. Um, do you have any experience with the Tesla solar roofs yet? Have you tried those or seen those in action? No, but we did uh, some uh, looking into that. Mm-hmm. Um, we feel like it's just a little too experimental at this point and that the people that are doing the work aren't necessarily, you know, we we just don't really know um, installers like where are they coming from who are they um you know there's salespeople going around selling tesla shingles but do they have any back-end support that actually these guys come in and do a really good job so yeah 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 i i kind of don't understand the opposition to the appearance of conventional p p pv i i think it's attractive i mean they're, they're very simple clean modern they're doing their job like like to me, efficiency is attractive. So, um, but but I also think my Prius is attractive, and and, and not everybody <laughs> does. So you know, I understand the uh, trade-offs. But no, I, I agree with you, Mike. I I feel like a, a nice blue or black glass panel on on my roof is is a pretty slick looking thing. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> I think it's just a matter of what people are accustomed to. Once things become commonplace, they get a little bit more used to the the look. That's a good point. But, uh, hey, Mason, I, I got a question for you. I was having a discussion with somebody recently who was asking about uh, adding mini splits or heat pumps to an old house. And when you're doing a retrofit, obviously, like on my house, they use the, um, those plastic channels that look like uh, downspouts to cover all the line sets. So yeah. you guys are doing heat pumps in this house. Are you going to incorporate them into the wall? Or are, you, are they going to go through the basement? How are you, doing the, how are you, how are you uh, dealing aesthetically with it? Yeah, they'll, they'll go directly through the wall. Um, They're not, they'll go through the wall. Actually, Dave probably has a better idea. He's really the on site guy more than I am. I'm the, uh, I'm the, the, the hired carpenter who, who goes and does stuff while Dave scratches his head with all these different, where are we putting this? Where are we putting that? Um, so you seem to be the spiritual leader of this project. <laughs> it's a, a very important role. Don't downplay it. That's true. <laughs> yeah. so, so what kind of a system is it though with the, uh, with the heat pumps? So we're doing uh, a system in the, uh, in the basement, air handler basement, air handler in the attic, and a, 
uh, Zender uh, ERV. We're also doing a Santander hot water heater. So that's, you know, air source heat, heat pump as well. Um, I think it's Mitsubishi that we're using for uh, the heat and, heating and cooling. And uh, uh, Audrey, Audrey's asking about ventilation. Did you just answer that? Sorry. No. Yeah, the, uh, the, Z the Zender ERV. Oh, okay. okay. Thanks. Yeah. I did, but uh, I wondered, are you doing any kind of dehumidification as well? Is that a thing for you guys in Connecticut? Well, it's becoming more and more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you know, that's a good question. I, I don't think we have any dehumidification in the, in the scope of work at this point. Yeah. But I do know because I, I go BS and beer every week and I hear about things like that. <laughs> I might have recorded a podcast with Nikki earlier today. So on the forefront. <laughs> Dehumidification. So with the HRV or with the Zender system, with the timber frame, do you run into problems running ductwork? Yeah, there's been a lot of challenges getting things from here to there and, you know, limited locations where we can put things and you know we have very sensitive architect and client who won't let us just put them wherever we want to put them so you know they're they're uh you know we we're pretty good on the aesthetic end of things but they're they're on top of us completely and and plus you know the owner's a really smart guy and he he knows how things work and he knows where he wants stuff to go so we, you know, there's limits where you can't just put it uh, because this or that. So, and, and the timber frame is certainly a big piece of that. Yeah. Col Colbert asks if you did any monitoring or sensors. And then also Harvey asked a question I was curious about it. If, how, how were this, the, the, the floor to ceiling heights? Those can be low in older houses. Yeah. So, I'm going to be talking to Colbert about those sensors because, uh, you know, we, I do want to put sensors in the wall. So tell him that he's going to have to help me figure that one out. Um, and the ceiling heights, um, they're, I want to say seven feet on the first floor and a little less on the second floor. Cozy, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, or yeah, you didn't. You, um, you didn't or didn't expose the, the tim timber framing ceilings, tim timber frame ceilings, or anything. Anything mm -hmm. you left the old plaster or repaired the old. No, one. no, we no, we we gutted the the interior completely, and we okay. did a lot of structural reinforcing. The floor joists that tied into the summer beams were like five by fives, and some of them strangely enough were like three and a half inches where they tied into beams and one of them was like five inches in the middle it was like it didn't sag it was actually shaped that way um so we did uh we put some uh, engineered lumber in in between the joists um it's all going to get plastered the timber frame in the front foyer will be exposed, but everywhere else it'll be uh, covered with either casing or plaster. So is the aesthetic of the house trying to mimic the period style everywhere or is there, are there a lot of, are there more modern details? No, it's really keeping it as close to the original um, as possible. Yeah, I mean, the fireboxes were changed except for the front foyer the mantles are changed. We're, we're keeping the 1970s uh, architectural woodwork in the fireplaces. Uh, the 18th century paneling on either side of the living room and dining room fireplaces are staying. Um, so we're, and you know, all the, the original oak floors are staying. Are you doing any to, anything to that staircase, Mason? No. The primary staircase? No. Staying where it is. Yep. I hope you didn't level the floors either. It won't feel authentic if you can't right. roll marble from one side <laughs> to the other. We, we actually did. We didn't level them, but we've done a lot of straightening. Um, 
but they're still they're still pretty wonky. You know, <laughs> I've <yeah>. walked on them. <laughs> <laughs> so Mason, I've got a question for you on that, since you've got so much uh, experience doing sort of um, archaeology, or you know, it's investigating the conditions of older houses and what's happened over the years. So my old house, you know, half the doors and windows are crooked, but the casings all have tight joints. So what? Did someone cut the doors right after they sagged early in the life of the house? Like, what do you think, what do you think is the, usually happens in those situations when you've got all the crooked floors and crooked doors and crooked moldings, but then the joints are tight. So you're saying like the joint, uh, like, so you know, like where the, where the head, head and, and sides of a casing meet, you know, like, cause you're talking about, Emily, you, you want to keep some of that character of, if you've got a crooked old house. Um, you see so many ho old houses like that with doors that have been cut to meet the, to match the sag of the house. Right. And do you think they recased, recut the casings on the doors too? No, it's just melting. <laughs> it's just like butter. It melts into the shape over time. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best explanation I have for that, Rob. <laughs> All right. At the risk of aligning myself with Justin, who I have an impending uh, tussle with, I just wanted to say how exciting it is uh, to see this much love and care go into a project that requires so much building science to make something old perform. It's, it's compelling uh, to see deep energy retrofit work going on at any level, but at this level where you're talking about a seven foot ceiling and all the, the character leans, uh, I, I don't know. I just, it's admirable uh, to see this from both you and from your client and architect. That's a, a valiant effort to make something that was once great, great again, uh, even to modern standards. I really would like to congratulate you. Thank you. Yeah, we, we feel very lucky. This is, uh, I've, I've said it and I hope it's not accurate, but I, it's a once in a lifetime project. Um, it's a rare situation to have the kind of team that we have for this project as well as an owner that supports what we're doing. That's excellent. Yeah, I, th I think you're, you're right because there were several people who looked at some of those details and things and the splits and said, oh, I would have pushed that down. And I think that there are probably a lot of people who who would have done that. Maybe some who would have salvaged some of the materials and used it for something else, but um, right. it's a pretty big undertaking when nothing is square, nothing is level, nothing is, you know, nine foot ceiling heights. There's no open concept. You know, you have to have somebody who really wants to live in, in that. So we're actually yeah. coming up on our, our five minute warning. So um, is there anything else that you'd like to kind of impart to the listeners tonight on the deep energy retrofit front? Um, uh, or either from this project or some of the other ones that you were, were precursors to this one. Well, uh, I, you know, I look forward to future challenges because it's going to be a rare antique home that we're going to be able to do that too, because there's going to be historic fabric. Um, you know, when I first saw pictures of this house, the gable end with those 12 over eights and eight, whatever, eight over eight windows, you know, it was like, wow, this is an incredibly beautiful building. I didn't realize it was from 1972. Um, so we're really not going to be doing a lot of deep energy retrofits. We're going to be doing what you saw in those earlier ones where, you know, we'll stop it at the attic floor. Um, we might do an elevation here and there, uh, go after the the biggest problem areas. Um, so this has just been a lot of fun and a lot of hard work to to get to where we are now. And, and it's ongoing, we got a long ways to go. So I know Kylie's gonna be following us through this. Yeah, so, I'll do a follow up. <laughs> yeah. What do you think your biggest lesson was from this project, Mason? What's your, what's your big takeaway? You're supposed to ask me that question before we go on. <laughs> <laughs> or what's, what's your biggest mistake so far? How's that? Okay, maybe that's easier. Uh, or, or if you want to, uh, 
or another quick question I have is what's the plan for the kitchen? Just, just, I love kitchen design and especially in, in old homes, it can be really challenging. Are you going historically correct, hand built on site or what's the, what's the plan? No, it, it'll be, uh, we have a cabinet maker that'll build it, but it's, it's, you know, traditional looking. It's, it's clean, simple. There's no goo guys going on with it. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, the, the, the biggest lesson, the, the mistake, um, we, we might not have made it yet, or might, we might not be aware of it yet. I, I would say that's more likely. We're not aware of the mistake. And um, going to get that lower door test out. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you'll, not find taking, you'll find it. <laughs> not taking out all those fireplaces. Uh, uh, yeah, because uh. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, um, Harvey put it maybe in a good way is what, what have you done so far that maybe you wouldn't do again? So say this that's isn't a standalone good. project, but mm -hmm. like, is there something you've done that you were like, oh, I probably wouldn't do that. Not because it was bad, but maybe it was hard or um, didn't go the way you thought it would. Uh, on this project or any project? Uh, Either well, way. Yeah, well, certainly, um, you know, that, that 2004 spray foam, um, you know, we're just not going to do that into an old home anymore. If, if we're ever using spray foam, we're going to use some sort of release paper. And, and that's iffy because if it's not adhering to the framing members, how good of a job is it actually doing? Um, and, you know, there's all other issues with, with spray foam too. But if you have a, you know, a three inch deep wall cavity, or even some of these old buildings have two and three quarters, what do you do? You know? It, More solar it, panels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm not saying we'll never use spray foam, but you know, one thing that maybe is another choice is if you're opening walls, you're using po recycled poly ISO that go into the cavities and then you spray foam around the edges for something like that, you know, get three inch thick poly ISO that's recycled and spray foam the edges. Um, because, you know, what are you gonna get if you blow in cellulose three, three inches, you know, you're like R10 or 11. So, and we're really not gonna use fiberglass, so. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I know this was a great follow-up to our preservation uh, session, Justin, uh, on <laughs> what people can do with deep energy retrofits and, <laughs> uh, and their low carbon materials. So uh, I appreciate you coming on and walking us through um, your past projects and what led to this one. Yeah, yes. thank you very thank much. Thank you, Mason. I enjoyed it. Well done. And I want to see Justin's comments because <laughs> I wasn't, no, I wasn't paying attention to the comments. I <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, too. Bye-bye. Thank